kelp forests are a valuable ecosystem in southern Australia. Recently, the proliferation of sea urchins has converted kelp forests to rocky barrens. In this presentation, we will discuss ways to prevent this phase shift and identify areas in need of further research. First, Charlotte will discuss the ecological and social importance of kelp forests. Rosie will identify the current and potential management actions that may restore kelp forests. Then, Minnie will discuss the ecological risks associated with these actions. Finally, Kinji will propose a management and research project that could restore the kelp forests of southern Australia. So why the spread of sea urchins and associated loss of kelp of ecological and social importance? Kelp forests are extensive underwater habitats that grow best in cold, nutrient-rich waters. They attain some of the highest rates of primary production of any natural ecosystem on Earth and dominate a quarter of the world's coastlines. Kelp forest support of a plethora of species has classified them as ecosystem engineers. They create complex biogenic habitats which influences physical conditions such as light, water flow, sedimentation, and pH. In addition to providing structural habitat, they provide an abundant food source for species such as fish, urchins, small crustaceans, and snails that graze directly on the attached kelp. Furthermore, as much as 80% of kelp forests become drift kelp, where they are detached from their point of origin and end up in adjacent or distant habitats and support food webs in which primary production is usually very low. Drift kelp is a primary source of food in many of these habitats and attracts a diverse community of detrivores and consumers, substantially increasing secondary production. Through these trophic subsidies and by providing an important transoceanic dispersal, drift kelp extends the ecological influence of kelp forest far and beyond the location where the kelp grew. Their importance was first acknowledged by Charles Darwin in 1839. He said in one of his journals, if in any country a forest was destroyed, I do not believe as many species of animals would perish as would hear from the destruction of kelp. These ocean forests are crucially important not only to marine plants and animals, but also to humans, who have been exploiting their rich resources for at least 10 to 70,000 years. Evidence suggests that early human might have evolved along the rocky coasts of southern Africa as a consequence of a rich diet of marine organisms supported by its highly productive kelp forest, including mussels and limplets, which provided the omega-3 fatty acids and trace elements required for brain function and development. Kelp forests also play an important role in the lives of modern humans by providing a broad range of ecosystem goods and services of great social, economic, and ecological value. These goods and services arise as direct contributors from kelp forests, such as kelp harvesting, commercial and recreational fishing, and tourism as well as indirect contributors via the functions of the kelp forest, such as habitat provision, climate control, and coastline protection. Or from the innate value of the kelp forest itself, for its scientific and cultural importance and biodiversity. It was found that kelp forests were worth 500,000 to 1 million Australian dollars per kilometer of coastline. Human impacts on marine foundation species have accelerated over the past four to five decades. A recent global study analysis revealed that 38% of the world's kelp forests have been in decline over the past five decades. Although interaction between local, regional, and global processors have produced complex responses in terms of the direction and ultimate drivers of kelp forest change. Weakened by rising ocean temperature, disease, and eutrophication, these oceanic forests have already been held under siege over the last decade. And now researchers worldwide have begun to notice a rapid urchin population increase since 2015. 
Scott Crowth, a shellfish scientist with Oregon's Department of Fish and Wildlife, said in an interview with VOA Science News. A recent count found 350 million purple sea urchins on one Oregon reef alone. That is more than a 10,000% increase in five years, where 90% of large kelp forests have been swallowed up. We're in uncharted territory. But why are sea urchin populations increasing worldwide? The main reason is predator loss due to climate change and anthropogenic reasons. Predators such as crabs, sea stars, lobsters, sea snails, and sea otters have been targeted through habitat degradation, oil spills, overfishing, and increasing temperatures, reducing their habitable space. Many of these predators, such as the sea star, provided a top-down regulation of the sea urchins. But a decrease in their population has encouraged sea urchin population growth. Sea urchins are important agents of disturbance and are frequently regarded as proximate determinants of community structure in a subtitle marine habitat. This generalization is based in part on evidence indicating that outbreak populations of sea urchins can decimate large kelp forest by inhibiting recruitment. A study done by Simon Reeves in 2016 found that the densities of four sea urchins per meter squared provided time for kelp recovery and avoided overgrazing, which was found to be destructive at eight urchins or more per meter squared. Furthermore, nutrient enhancement to stimulate kelp growth was found to be futile in marine reserves to reinstate trophic dynamics and to increase the resilience of kelp beds. Marine parks on the eastern coast of Tasmania have purposefully reintroduced predators in order to minimize the habitat shifts and they have found hands-on techniques to reduce urchin population growth, which will be further explained in part four. There are a number of management actions that can be taken to restore kelp forests. A top-down approach to control the number of urchins in these ecosystems is to increase the abundance of urchins' natural predators. In southern Australia, these predators are rock lobsters and some fish species. A project in New Zealand successfully established marine protected areas to protect local populations of lobsters and fish and saw an increase in their abundances. The figure to the right shows lower urchin numbers in areas where their predators are not fished. However, the effectiveness of using marine protected areas to restore kelp forests can be limited. An experiment in Tasmania that introduced thousands of lobsters to urchin barrens had varied results in restoring kelp forests. The researchers found that lobsters would have to eat an order of magnitude more urchins for this strategy to actually help restore kelp canopies. This can be attributed to hysteresis, a phenomenon where the desired effects lag behind the change to the ecosystem. Kelp forests can also be restored by transplanting adult or juvenile kelp from donor sites. A study published this year of kelp restoration in Australia calls this approach active restoration. Kelp is either introduced to the target site from another area or cultivated in a lab and outplanted to the site. In order for this strategy to be successful, the target area needs adequate natural recruitment of juvenile kelp. Recruitment can be optimized by introducing juvenile and adult kelp together. One of the most successful kelp restoration projects in Australia to date is the Operation Crayweed Initiative which began planting kelp off the coast of New South Wales in the summer of 2017. The figure here shows how the initiative scored on several ecosystem health indices. As you can see, the project improved ecosystem functions and species compositions. However, the recovery of species in higher trophic levels may take longer. Improvements made by these projects may also be limited by the spatial scale of the sites so further study is needed on broader ecosystem benefits. Another method for restoring kelp forests is by physically removing urchins. This process is called urchin culling. In one study, commercial divers harvesting abalone were instructed to cull urchins during their routine harvests. Essentially, divers smash urchins in a target patch using a tool called an abalone iron. This tool, pictured on the right, 
is used for scraping abalone from their substratum. The study, in collaboration with the Tasmanian Abalone Council, found that smashing urchins in these areas allowed for the recolonization of kelp. However, culling efforts by divers only reduced a small proportion of the urchin population, which is evident in the table below, highlighted in red. This strategy may be successful in the short term, but the results are varied and only occur at highly localized sites. Aside from being killed directly, there is potential for urchins to be harvested and sold to markets. Urchins are a valuable seafood product worth the equivalent of 100 US dollars per kilogram. There is already a high demand for urchins in Chinese and Japanese markets. Today, market demand for urchins in Australia is low, but studies are looking at the potential use of urchins in aquaculture. Doing so would broaden the base of aquaculture, introduce new products to growing markets, and provide employment opportunities. The organization AgriFutures Australia has funded an urchin aquaculture project in collaboration with several universities. This project is studying the market potential for urchins harvested from southeastern Australia. These markets would simultaneously benefit the economy and aid in kelp forest recovery. Urchin populations can also be reduced through means of biocontrol. This involves introducing a bacterial disease to a population of urchins. One study of urchins in Europe identified a disease that causes lesions on the body surface. The disease, known as bald sea urchin disease, was found to be contagious among individuals. Another study, published in 2014, showed how outbreaks of disease caused mass mortality of sea urchins. The figure below shows outbreaks expressed with arrows and the urchin populations following these outbreaks. As you can see, urchin populations declined in years following outbreaks of disease. The study also found that frequent outbreaks of disease helped stabilize the kelp bed state of the ecosystem. These results are promising for the potential use of biocontrol in reducing urchin numbers to improve the resilience of kelp beds. Kelp forests are inextricably linked to the productivity and biodiversity of marine ecosystems. Kelp may be classified under the criteria of an ecosystem engineer due to the role it plays in modifying the local environment through structural, abiotic and biotic engineering. Kelp is responsible for a wide variety of functions, including the provision of structure and habitat and modification of abiotic processes such as water flow, sedimentation and light, which cumulatively affect the structure and abundances of marine biota. However, as was previously stated, the abundance of kelp forests is declining dramatically in the face of increased anthropogenic influences and accelerated climate change, which facilitates the growth of invasive species like urchins. Estimates of this massive increase in urchins may be modelled from a historical time series constructed by experts Carnell and Keogh, which found that urchin populations became up to 420% more abundant between 2005 and 2012. This increase in urchin populations poses very prominent ecological risks by increasing grazing, dominating the ecosystem to create urchin barrens and facilitating a reduction in kelp density. These barrens are extremely stable alternative states, responsible for the disruption of normal ecosystem patterns and processes due to the loss of kelp. Barrens can extend over thousands of kilometres and are characterised by low productivity and reduced food web complexity. The resulting disruption of the patterns and abundances of fish and invertebrate species also has a long-term effect on marine-based industries like local fisheries and tourism. Due to the stability of this alternative barren state, this phase shift is extremely difficult to reverse and the recovery of kelp forests is a highly complex task. The drivers of these regime shifts are often associated with large-scale oceanographic change, which makes management far more difficult. It is expected, then, that the effective conservation of kelp-centred ecosystems requires a thorough understanding of the structure and resilience of these complex environments. To fully grasp the ecological risks posed by phase shifts from kelp forests to urchin barrens, we should be focused on creating longitudinal studies of kelp and urchin communities. According to Philby Dexter and Schiebling, Manipulative field experiments are extremely effective in providing evidence of the thresholds for state shifts and system-specific feedback mechanisms that could potentially stabilise an ecosystem. 
By conducting experiments which remove urchins from a system, we may observe the thresholds necessary for the recovery of kelp as well as discern any potentially negative implications of interfering with the ecosystem state. An example of the importance of predetermining the effectiveness of management may be in the ability to foresee unintentional shifts to further alternative states, such as microalgae-dominated ecosystems. Many of the management strategies discussed previously are highly valuable to the cause. However, we recognise that the complete removal of invasive urchins and recovery of kelp systems is not a realistic goal to strive for without the development of a larger global initiative. This is particularly true under environmental change like increasingly severe ocean temperatures and altered currents. Hence, achievable strategic intervention should be informed by models of the current abundance and future growth weight of urchins against prevailing and predicted future conditions, including that of changing nutrient pH, CO2 and temperature levels. In the case of the suggested management strategies, like those regarding biocontrol of barrens through the introduction of species-specific disease strains, implementation would be most effective with complete clarity surrounding the potential impacts on the structures and elements of the ecosystem. We suggest that future research be dedicated to the experimental application of the strategy to determine the long- and short-term ecological risks posed by this type of management. This includes the study of the disease in isolation, under normal ecosystem conditions, and under predicted future conditions. Ultimately, the structural complexity of marine ecosystems, changing environments, and the stabilising nature of phase shifts necessitates considerable management effort in order to facilitate the recovery of kelp ecosystems from merchant barrens. Our management plan and research project is aimed at reducing the population of purple sea urchins thereby encouraging the rehabilitation of kelp forests. The management plan consists of two phases which would be held over the course of four years. In the first year, phase one consists of collecting purple sea urchins from a five kilometre squared section of bay near Williamstown. This area would be selected as it contains remnant kelp forest and would be revisited as a part of the research project. A study conducted in 2019 estimated that there could be as many as 600,000 purple sea urchins in any 10,000 square metres of Port Phillip Bay. This informed our decision to recommend gathering a representative sample of 1,200 urchins. After the urchins have been collected, they would then be exposed to the bacterium Vibrio angularum under laboratory conditions. This bacterium has been recorded as occurring in South East Australian waters as recently as 2016, and it is implicated as an agent for the bold sea urchin disease that can afflict our target species. It is theorised that reintroducing infected individuals back into Port Phillip Bay will allow this disease to act as a limiting factor on purple sea urchin populations. After the first stage has concluded, Phase 2 of the management plan will occur over the next three years. Once a year in November, divers will opportunistically cull any adult purple sea urchins that are found at the management site. The assumption here is that a small number of urchins will develop a level of bacterial resistance, which is a trend that has been observed in other cases of biocontrol. By preemptively culling adults before the breeding season in summer, this would prevent a small case of bacterial resistance from spreading to the whole population. Purple sea urchins take at least two years to reach sexual maturity, so culling every year will add an extra layer of precaution. We recommend that a research project be carried out before, during and after the enactment of the management plan. This will provide us with an initial baseline of kelp populations in the bay, and allow us to monitor the effectiveness of the management plan. The research project will consist of measuring the area covered by kelp forest in the management site. Options for monitoring work include diving and physically measuring kelp forests, or using satellite imagery to gain an estimate of cover. We recommend taking physical measurements as a visual appearance of forest cover from a bird's eye view could be influenced by weather or tidal flows. It could therefore appear more or less abundant in satellite imagery. 
The introduction of biocontrol agents is considered to be a high-risk management activity. This is because it is difficult to predict how it could affect not only a target species, but also other organisms within that ecosystem. There are many other echinoderm species that live in Port Phillip Bay, and artificially supporting the proliferation of a disease-causing bacterium could negatively impact them as well. Throughout Australia's history, we've witnessed both successes and abject failures when using biocontrol methods. However, these have been mostly land-based cases. The application of biocontrol methods in a marine context is less well understood. Kelp forests could also be sensitive to anthropogenic or climate-related factors, meaning that the reduction of purple sea urchins alone might not be enough to protect them. Of all the listed ecological risks, the potential for our target species to develop bacterial resistance is the only one that has been addressed in our management plan. Here we have provided a proposal budget. This is after considering all the costs involved in the successful completion of both the management plan and the research project. When considering the cost of many other projects, the current budget estimate provides opportunities for future extensions to this project. Doubling the management area would result in an overall cost increase of 15% due to a doubling of divers needed to cover the extra area. Extending the research project by an extra five years would increase the costs by 70%. But doubling the management area plus extending the research project by five years would amount to a total of $132,400, which is still 86% cheaper than a project costing $1 million.